Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. I know it's a little bit warm here, but yes, you know, climate crisis. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Uh, my name is Milka Yamana, and I will moderate this session today, and I'm really excited to do that because I've been seeing this youth working really, really hard, and uh, as it looks really promising for the future. So thank you guys for giving me that hope. No, really. But you all will sh soon hear what they have to say. Um, like I said, my name is Milka, and I am the head of the International Foundation of GroenLinks, that is the um, foreign office of the Green Left Party here in the Netherlands and we do various things but we uh, support and facilitate uh, green political parties and green movements in the Middle East and Southeast Europe and next to that I'm a city councillor here in the city for the Green Left Party. Uh, this session today is organized by the Africa Youth Think Tank of Foundation Max van der Stoel and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs published an Africa's strategies in spring last year. One of the key words of this strategy is equal partnerships. But what does this mean? How does an equal relationship between the Netherlands and Europe and the African continent looks like and how can we shape it? With these questions, 15 young people from the Africa Day Youth Think Tank have been working on for the past few months. Based on presentations from policy officers and academics and conversation with a lot of youth organizations in the Netherlands and in Africa, they created their vision and advice for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And today they will show you their vision. So I would like to introduce now the two speakers, Anne-Lotte Perdijk and Noah Hogerwerf. And they will introduce also the dilemma. Thank you so much. This is open. Thank you so much, Milka, uh, for being here today and for this wonderful introduction. So as she said, my name is Anolot, and I, here next to me stands Noah, and we are both members of the youth think tank for the FMS. And before diving into today's panel discussion, we are going to introduce our dilemma that we have been working on. So for the past few weeks, we started in September, we've been working on our dilemma uh, that focuses on equal relationships. Um, it was presented to us by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Our dilemma consists of three main questions. What, do equal what does an equal relationship mean? How do we shape it? And lastly, what is the space for differences? The central premise of our answer to these questions is that ultimately the relationship between Africa and Europe is inherently unequal. Um, when looking at both past and present, leading us to believe that an equal relationship would be better translated to an equitable relationship. <clears throat> well, what does that mean, an equitable relationship, you may ask? Um, it is um, an equitable relationship includes values such as fairness, equal opportunities, and accountability. accountability. Equal, means, equal means everybody is given the same thing or the same amount. Equitable means everybody is given what they need in order to do the same thing. The Africa strategy tries to incorporate these values to some extent, but even calling the relationship equal, equal from now on um, denies the reality of the relationship. Equity then recognizes the inequality of the relationship in the past and can produce policies to make up for the past injustices. In order to illustrate um, the importance of an e equitable relationship, we have used a frequently discussed topic in the Africa strategy critical raw materials. Could I see a raise of hands if you have a smartphone? That's almost everyone, yeah. And what about an electric car or hybrid? Yeah, so did you know that the core materials used in the production of a smartphone and an electric car both find their ori origin in what we call critical raw materials? They are materials which are economically and strategically important for the European economy, but they have a high risk associated with their supply. They are frequently discussed in the Africa strategy as the Netherlands will depend on the African continent in the future for the green energy transition and will need materials such as cobalt or lithium. So at the beginning of this journey, we had two main... <gasps> <laughs> it works. <laughs> 
we had two main uh, objectives. So one was to organize a session during Africa Day. Well, we're here, so <laughs> yay us. <laughs> and the second was to present the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with advice in regards to the Africa strategy. And our message, which is portrayed on the PowerPoint, is that we believe that for the relationship to become more equitable, the Netherlands must make a point of supporting African countries at both a national and a European level to add value to the supply chain of critical raw materials before ex exporting them. This would allow African nations to strengthen their economic position. There's much to be said about the subject, which is why we have a panel discussion afterwards, but before diving into that panel discussion, our group has put together uh, a short video uh, to hopefully stimulate some reflection in all of us. Uh, this skit portrays a scenario in which a mine is discovered in Kronia, that is exploited by a Congolese uh, mining company for its critical raw materials. So this is a reaction or a news report on how the Netherlands re reacts. So please enjoy, and after that, we will leave place for the panel discussion. NOS Journaal, live vanuit de studio in Hilversum. Een hele goede avond, het is 8 uur. Mijn naam is Marise van den Burg. U kijkt naar het NOS Journaal, live vanuit de studio in Hilversum. Met vandaag in het nieuws grote protesten die zijn uitgebroken in onze hoofdstad Amsterdam tegen het mijnbeleid van Congolees mijnbedrijf Mining Co. in Groningen. Ten aanzien van de lithium- en kobaltmining ter facilitatie van de energietransitie. Ik denk dat het ook wel uh, een onderbelicht thema is in ons land. Uh, we weten allemaal wel wat er gebeurt hier in Groningen, maar we proberen het weg te drukken, want we hebben schaamte. Uh, ten eerste begint mijn dag omdat ik wakker, wakker word gemaakt door de werktuigapparaten die extreem luidruchtig zijn. Niet door mijn wekker dus. Dan stap ik tegen mijn zin op die fiets naar mijn werk en word ik bedreigd door de milities die de, die de mijnen beschermen. Ingehuurd door de gemeente. Hè? Die corrupte gemeente van ons. Dan, uh, dan, dan kom ik uiteindelijk thuis en wil ik gewoon rustig relaxed barbecuen met mijn kinderen. En als er zoveel stof door die mijners, dat mijn kinderen gewoon bijna beginnen te huilen. Dank u wel, meneer Tlani. Ook hier bij mij in de studio, woordvoerder van Mining Co, André Kunitsongo. Kinderen die stoffelijke resten ophoesten. Wat is uw eerste reactie hierop als woordvoerder? Ja, Marise, mensen zeggen natuurlijk wat ze willen. Hè? Kijk, wij hebben ook een corporate responsibility. Wij zorgen dat deze kinderen die zojuist benoemd worden, op schoolreisjes gaan naar Arctis. Zorg dat hun boeken betaald worden. Dat is corporate responsibility. Dat is mining en co. Niet die stoffelijke resten. En laten we even eerlijk zijn. We zijn toch allemaal pro natuur. Iedereen wil dat deze green transition soepel en snel gebeurt. En ook de mensen in Congo. Ja meneer Kasongo. Ik begrijp natuurlijk heel goed wat u bedoelt met corporate social responsibility. En met de energietransitie. Echter is het wel zo dat er bepaalde voorwaarden zijn verbonden aan deze begrippen. Hoe kijkt u hier naar? Ja, voorwaarden. Kijk, ik bedoel, we maken de winst wel. En die winst die geven we gewoon terug. Aan deze omgeving waar je naar heen. 
kijk, Mining Co. die heeft gewoon een goede geschiedenis. We hebben handjes geschud met deze mensen. We hebben, zoals ik zeg, hun kinderen op een schoolreisje gebracht. We betalen hun gewoon een minimumloon. Ik bedoel, wat, wat ga je nog meer van ons verwachten? Deze Green Transition is key. Het is noodzakelijk. En de winst, ja, kijk, daar kunnen wij ook niks aan doen. Hè? Dat vraag is, is simpelweg aanbod. Ja, dames en heren, u hoort het. Corporate Social Responsibility, de energietransitie en een gemeenschap in wanhoop. Dit was het NOS Journaal. Bedankt voor het kijken en een fijne avond. Fantastisch, toch? Nou, echt fantastisch. Heel goed gedaan. Um, I would like to introduce our next panelist um, to join me here. First of all, that's Max Koffi. Please come. <laughs> you can sit there, yes. Max Koffi is the founder of Equal Trade Alliance. The ETA aims at brings at European and African uh, professional students and civil society actors together to reflect upon the current trade relationships between Europe and Africa, as well as the challenges they arise. Uh, next, I would like to invite is Marika Kukuk. She's a lawyer <laughs> and a Dutch politician. She's in the chamber right now. She has uh, insights into du both Dutch politics and politics at the EU level surrounding this topic. Applause for Marika. <laughs> and our third speaker is Solomon Zori. Solomon G. Zori is a senior lecturer at the Rotterdam School of Management. He can come. <laughs> <laughs> at Erasmus University, his personal and professional experience gives him a versatile perspective on both on business and economics in both Africa and in Europe. So, we just saw a very fantastic video, right? Please, can I have a small first reaction of all three of you? Can I start with you, Marika? Yes, yes please. Yeah, I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was, um, uh, you should show this before any trade committee meeting in, uh, <laughs> in, the, in the parliament. Yeah. Yes, I had the same feeling. Ma Marika, you did very good. And now I know you have a talent <laughs> as, as journalist. So, uh, with the Equal Trade Alliance, I know someone to uh, <laughs> to bring the news to the uh, outside world from now on. <laughs> you will use this in your work, no? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. And from my side, it's a uh, it's a starting point to be more critical about uh, the narrative of uh, the economic surrounding um, uh, natural resources, um, be it in Europe or be it in Africa. And some of these topics that were highlighted, things like corruption, so corporate social responsibility, uh, these are critical things that should uh, should always be in the narrative, no matter where the resource is located. And sadly, in Africa, it's quite uh, a, top, a tough topic. And so I hope that we can delve down to these topics. Yes, I hope so too. Thank you so much. So for this conversation, we have two motions. And I would like to start with the first one. You will see it here in the screen. I think, no, here, yeah, there it is. So the first one is, a truly equitable relationship between the Netherlands and the African continent needs to be more ambitious due diligence legislation right now. Who would like to give the first reaction? Marika, could I give you the floor again? <laughs> Thank you, well, I fully uh, uh, agree with the statement. Um, so. Uh, you might be aware, so in the, in the Netherlands we have started an initiative, not, not just us, but other countries. Uh, Gisteren Unie has been in the lead of this to have a uh, binding uh, national corporate social responsibility law. Uh, that is actually going a lot farther than what is now currently being discussed at the European level, because the European Union has also this uh, legislative trajectory. And that would, if, in, uh, if uh, uh, accepted, that would um, obligate us to enforce the same standards that we want when we have production here mm. for
for any product that enters the European market. And that is mainly used as a legislative tool for companies to um, make sure that there's no exploitation, there's no child labor, there's no um, climate crisis under mining. So that would be, I think, a good first step. And what I see happening now is that not only corporations, but also certain countries are trying to lower those standards at the European level and trying to dismiss the efforts at the national level. So there's quite a great lobby against uh, having better due diligence standards that are binding. Mm. Okay, thank you. Maybe a first reaction as well from you, Max? Yeah. I mean, you know, I've been knowing Max for a very long time. And uh, when I was, like, this, y the youth here gives yeah. me a lot of hope. But when I was as young as they are, I mean, that was last year, of course. <laughs> um, I mean, I was always looking to forefighters for these kind of topics. And for me, this one of the very forefighters who's been doing this a very long is Max Coffey. So I'm really interested to hear your perspective on this motion. Yeah, and I'm still standing. <laughs> because the objectives has to be uh, reached still. So I agree with this, but I have a different approach on it. Mm. Um, I don't want to talk about ambition. I want to talk about a new kind, a new way of thinking. We need to renew our relation with Africa. Why? It's important for Europe itself. Now we're talking about the Netherlands. And I'm happy to have you because you have a European vision when it's come to politics. But thinking about the geopolitical position of Europe in Africa, it's time to rethink the all approach. I'm still hearing things like uh, development aid. Mm -hmm. In the parliament, they are discussing about we need to increase the, 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 the amount of money inv uh, for development aid. And other political parties say we don't need to do that. I still hear things like we need to help Africa. But uh, the reality, and that's what I'm doing now, try to get people understand what is the role of Africa for industrialized countries. With African raw materials, we are feeding all our industries in industrialized world, not only in the Netherlands, <coughs> in all Europe, the United States, and Asia. So without Africa, that is something the, 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 and all the former president of France said it in an official interview. He said, without Africa, France should be a third world country. Mm. So for me, the most important is to rethink our approach and of the relationship with Africa. And I will come back on that. That is why we have created the Equal Trade Alliance. This is the new way of dealing with Africa. I've read the, 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 the statement. I think the second one is where I'm going to explain what it is. So I agree with this, but we need to go further. It's about a new relationship. Thank you. Solomon. I think uh, I agree with both speakers, and I'm going to add some icing on the cake. Um, so start with uh, the fact that there is legislation at the European level. There have always been legislation. There have always been um, some kind of rule making, you know, from the Kimberley Clark Act to the Dodd Frank Act to the Conflict Minerals Act, and 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 all the different type of acts we've created to force companies to be responsible in developing countries. Sadly, they don't follow it. They go, uh, they bribe everybody. They spill oil. Uh, in Nigeria, in de developing countries, and simply don't follow the rules, and 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 these people are, are, are suffering, are still suffering. So legislation alone doesn't do it. Okay, legislation alone, enacting layers and layers of paperwork and not taking any critical action, real action, will not solve the problem. First point. Second point. Uh, coming back to coffee. Um, aid to Africa. I think we uh, it's saying that we want to help Africa. No, Africa needs to help Europe. Africa needs to help the world. And that's what we need to say, that it's not just about you giving money. Um, I, I'm from a finance background, so let me talk about the money part um, quite in detail. Um, so it's always been a one-way traffic. So 
Europe developed world well, puts a little bit of money in Africa, and then they take out 10 times, 20 times more than what they have already put in. And it always looks like it's help. Okay, we help you, uh, but everything comes back here. And it sounds like uh, um, that uh, we have to be depending on that. Even, even for that, we have to beg for it. Yeah, we have to beg for it. Let me speak about development finance for a while. Development finance. Um, it's always the fact that when developing countries borrow to create these raw materials, we borrow at 10%. We borrow at 15%. When Europe borrows, they borrow at mm. close to 0%. Mm. Now, so by the time we finish extracting the raw material and bringing it to Europe, we are already indebted to you. And then, of course, your behavior impacts us down there. So how is that behavior? Consumer behavior, we consume more, um, and then the climate com change comes, um, and then we are at the forefront of it, but never really get a fair price for everything that you take out. Mm. So that narrative also has to be brought to bear and that we need to start discussing it, that we need each other. First, we need each other to survive as, a, uh, uh, as humanity. Mm. Okay, Climate change is not a friend of any of us. Mm. So when the water level come, it will not only be in Africa that will be impacted, or when the droughts come, it's not only Europe that will be impacted. We all will be washed away. So we need each other. Mm. That means the word equity the word equality has to be re-taught. Re and um, this time, no more talk, no more talk, mm. action. Action. Mm. So talking about action, Marika, <laughs> <laughs> you were just talking about the new steps that your party, but also the Christian Union, um, how, so this is policy, new policy, but they're talking about action and how are we going to implement it right now? And how are we going to make sure that it's not going to be another act like we've seen in the previous years? Uh, <laughs> I think the good part about this new legislation is that it demands accountability from companies here, which means uh, once something starts to hurt us, that's what I thought uh, was so good in the in the movie we saw. You see what would ha what would it do what it would do to us as society once Dutch people would get hurt by um, the activities of a company, and so. The legislation, I think, needs to be um, up, up to standard and then adopted because then we can hold accountability to companies. And next to that, I think what we need to do, especially as Europe, um, we need to use our trade instruments in a different way. So we all know we have treaties that we can conduct with countries bilaterally or sometimes plurilaterally with several countries at the same time. There is another layer internationally in the World Trade uh, Organization where most of the countries of the world come together. And in all those different levels, we use our trade uh, instruments as Europe, as the Netherlands, we use it very much for our own gain. Mm. I think we need to use it in a different way. To give one concrete example, I, I won't get too technical, but um, when I was learning trade law, uh, I learned that coffee is actually originating from Germany. Why? The coffee bean is exported from the country where it's grown, and then coffee is produced in Germany because you need certain kind yeah. of factories for that. Yeah. That's weird. That's really weird. And I think we need to change the um, weird rules that we made, yeah. uh, both at the international level and in our own <laughs> treaties. Because what um, is bothering me a lot is that lately, when we from the Netherlands discuss the relationship with African countries, we often do that in um, a tone in a way that's uh, basically demanding from, com from countries in Africa uh, to keep your people there. And so we will give you money. That is, I'm, I'm making it a bit simple now, but that is basically well, the narrative. It is kind of the narrative, right? Yeah. I think that's completely yeah. wrong. And you can't say as the Netherlands, as Europe, that you're working towards an equal relationship when you keep doing that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I see Max is already yeah. there. And uh, maybe <laughs> something we need to, uh, to talk about. What should Africa uh, be doing to have an equal relationship with, Af uh, with Europe? Because now we are talking from our perspectives. Yeah. I've been asked, I think, by three political parties this year to, uh, to come on the list for the, Europe, uh, for the um, elections, and I refused it. And they asked me why. This is a huge opportunity. And I told them I don't want to do that because I am working on becoming a politician in Africa. Mm. So. My plan is to have a pan-African political party. Why am I saying this? The, the problem at this moment, when we talk about 
equality in the relationship, Africa doesn't play any role in it because we don't have this political power. Africa governments doesn't mean nothing to the world. They don't have voices. So to reach this equitable relationship now or in the future, Africa needs to be restructured at political level. We need to have more power in Africa to decide because now we're talking about companies. You know, I was making a joke with you the, the, this afternoon. I told them this company is about, okay, before they come in, you give them a vision. But you can also say you are not allowed to come in. Mm. That's another diff different position. Then you can start talking about equality. So that's my point. What I really want to see happening is more uh, from the African side to take responsibility and to agree about the power position of Africa. Mm. That's what we are missing at this moment. Our government, our leaders don't understand how important Africa is for the world. And they are not using that in discussion or negotiation with other countries. Mm. So that's my point. Okay. Thank you. So I would like to add, add something. Yes, I would like to add a little <laughs> okay. bit more on that one um, in terms of political organization and how um, uh, the, the macroeconomic structures of African countries play a role in this narrative. So typically, you find that if you have a, a private sector engagement, not on the bilateral level, not on the multilateral level, private sector engagement, firms go in and they do simply do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So there's no discussion at the you know, political level as uh, bilaterals talking as equals. Okay, so if you want to talk about equality, who is going to enforce it? The private sector? We already did. Several years ago, private companies went to Africa, did whatever they wanted to do, nobody could check anything, and it's still going on. So if you want to keep, keep this narrative and say we want to establish equity or equality, and you leave it in the hands of uh, private sector, private companies, capitalism would always win. Okay, capitalism would always win. We need a discussion at the national level between the European Union, between individual member states, to start engaging African political leaders at an equitable level. Mm. That is the solution that we, we should be discussing. But if we continue the way we are and say every company can simply go and do whatever they want and at the individual level, they would be negotiating on their behalf. Capital goes where they can get the highest returns. Mm. When investors in the Netherlands put money in a private company, they want that private company to go down to Africa and bring the maximum return. They will not be talking about equality or equity when they get there. No, that's not what they will be talking about. They'll be talking about their highest return. So it has to be at the macro, I mean, at the macro level, states, unions, and political, um, you know, people, people who in power mm. to start discussing equality at a level. Mm. Thank you so yeah. much. So actually what I've been hearing is arrange, but also organize this political power. And then this political power also from the African perspective should be there when we discuss this motion, number one. And what Marika was saying is actually we all should also look uh, while they are on the table, also look at these trade laws that we actually designed what's only benefits for us. Okay, thank you so much. We will go on to the next motion. Can I have the slide so everyone can read along? Um, this motion is about supporting African countries in adding a value to their critical raw materials. Expert will make both Africa and Europe prosper. Max. I know you were waiting for this. Don't act surprised. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah? Yes, please. Start? Yeah, you can start. Again, I think it's a very good idea. I hear it uh, frequently. But honestly, I don't think it's realistic. That's the only problem with this uh, statement. Why? Why? <laughs> okay. Uh, how many reasons should I <laughs> give? <laughs> I can give you three reasons. Yeah? First, it will take a very, 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 very long period of time to give you one example. How are you going to process coltan in Congo? Mm. Let's say the Dutch government decide to do it. Yeah? And they get the money for it. They say, okay, we're going to do it. How long it will take to be realized? taking into account what's happening now in Africa. 
The African youth cannot take this situation any longer. People are suffering. The youth in Africa doesn't have any hope. They don't have jobs. They don't have any opportunities. So if we invest in something that will take one more century, the risk is very big that you encounter a kind of social explosion, which will make doing business in Africa impossible. That's one reason. Second reason, African governments at this moment, and this small nation state, they don't have the capital to invest in it. It costs a lot of money to process these strategic raw materials. We are not talking about cassava here. We are not talking about cocoa. We are talking about uranium. We are talking about lithium. We're talking about billions of investment. And African government don't have the money. So they will have to ask for foreign direct investment again. And what is going to happen? The money will go back mm. outside of Africa. Mm. What they can create is maybe create some jobs. Mm. But one, that's the second reason. We don't have the money. And the third reason is related to climate change. Why do we want to reproduce the linear industry we have here in Europe and in Asia that had led to climate change? Why are we going to do it in Africa again? Mm. I prefer, my government will prefer telling Europe, listen, if you want to invest in industrialization in Africa, it has to be bio-based industrialization. Africa should take the lead in clean industry in the world mm. because we don't have this linear industry yet. Mm. So it's a huge opportunity. So for those three reasons, I think it's not, how to say that? I wouldn't recommend to go for this strategy. The best way to solve the problem right now in Africa, mm. let me tell you that, is this. The equal trade certification. We have industry here in Europe, in Asia, in the United States. We have the raw materials in Africa. Mm. We need a new agreement in which we said, you get the raw material, you process the raw material, and the finished product from the raw material, we share the revenue made out of mm, this. Okay. So and with that money, we can reinvest in Africa in cleaner industrialization. Okay. That is uh, the, the, the plan we are advocating for. Marika, if you listen to this plan, I mean, you were also talking about how can we uh, you know, change maybe these, these trade laws, and he's actually giving maybe an, an option. How does this sound to you? Yeah, no. In all fairness, so we met we met earlier in the in the coffee room downstairs, and uh, we, were, we were talking about this. I think this is a really good idea. I was struggling a bit with this uh, statement because precisely because of mainly the second reason. So to create a, a new industry, you need investment, you need money, and and then we all kind of know where the next power fight is going to be, namely who's going giving the money, because those who give the money decide the terms. And I think that is the uh, sort of historic inequality injustice that we need to break through and then I think it is better to establish a different um, value to raw materials to processed um, goods mm. than we have now so now the rules are the the less processed the good is the less value it has and I, I that is strange if you l indeed think about the main challenge that we as humanity have namely sustainable energy so then I think it is better to put our efforts there uh, to change those uh, those rules, but also perhaps to look at um, ways that new technology can help us in terms of sustainable energy production and, and, and then transporting it to other places, for example. So look at the opportunities that are unique in African countries. Same goes for establishing the digital economy. Mm. Um, those are things that, that Europe, because we have a fossil industry and we rely on that, so we kind of in missing the boat on the new economy. Mm. Uh, so, and I think that is what we should see as a, as a chance and as a uh, necessary chance to take also when we are looking at uh, cooperation. But let's say I'm a big director of this big chocolate factory. Wha what is it in for me? I mean, why would I, or why would my government 
would say yes to these kind of propositions. Uh, there, there, I think we, we should not look too much to say what we did in the past voluntary cooperation. Uh, that's why I am a, um, okay, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I'm maybe a, a above average fan of laws, but yeah. uh, <laughs> that <laughs> That, that's why I have a lot of faith in the, this new uh, sustainable corporate. Uh, uh, hey? Sorry, I, I know the Dutch word, but uh, corporate sustainable respond. Thank you. That one. Uh, She's from the news, so she knows. Yeah. That ex the NOS knows everything. Well done. Um, b because that forces that uh, chocolate factory to yeah. keep those standards in check. And if you don't do it, then we here in the Netherlands can hold you accountable. And I think that's what's been missing. Yeah. The, the accountability has always been sort of voluntary or in countries where yeah. companies produce and now i think that should move to the netherlands or to the Euro to europe because here we have um sort of the teeth that bite yeah the lack of yeah. accountability thank you so much yeah. solomon can so i, 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 I like to add some flavor to both uh, both comments Perfect. first <laughs> he has the icing on the cake now another flavor <laughs> it's a cook yeah. yes some flavor so um coffee um your idea that um it may not work, and I think it can't work mm -hmm. if regulation plays a role here. Yeah. That's where regulation is needed. Mm -hmm. Now, it can work for several reasons. First, we can say, if Europe simply says, we don't want raw materials in Europe anymore, end of story. Yeah. We don't want our raw materials to be transported all the way from Africa just to be processed in Europe. Why would we want to bring cobalt, uranium, from wherever it is in Africa, just to process it in the Netherlands and then send it back? Yeah. Did you know that the largest export of African countries from the Netherlands is fuel? Energy, yeah. the petrol to drive the car. So the oil, the crude oil comes from Africa. From it's here. processed back door here, right here in the Netherlands yeah. and sent back to, to Africa yeah. and sold 10 times how much it was imported. Why can't Shell build a refinery closer to the resource? And not just build the refinery, build a sustainable refinery. Exactly. Because we don't want to make the mistakes that we've already made for hundreds of years. We want to correct that. We want to build a sustainable refinery, but don't build it in the Netherlands. Build it somewhere close to the resource. Then mm -hmm. the profit from that is equitably distributed between the host country and where the fuel is going. Yeah. But they were saying but there's there no, we you need, need money. regulation. We need regulation. Yeah, but you, on, the, on this score, you have the money. Yeah. Europe has the money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not only don't you have the money, even if you don't have the money, like I indicated earlier, when you issue bonds, green bonds, you get it at coupon rate of 0.003%. Yeah. When Africa issues the same coupon rate, the same green bond, we issue it at 8%. The people who need a break on the financing for development, for sustainable financing to, to, to set up an industry to save all of us, mm -hmm. we get it at 10 times the rate of coupon rate. But you don't need it probably. You get it at zero. So yeah. if you can issue it at zero, build the same refinery, sustainable, not just any refinery, sustainable factory yeah. in Africa. R let us run it as a corporation, as equals, and let's share equitably. I have the resource, you have the money. Let's do it, and let's be, equi uh, let's, let's be equal on this one. Mm. Okay. Yeah, let's be equal on this one. It's a win-win. And Max was, but Max was stating, yeah. we need money for that, right? Yes. For the first, yeah. but you said, because Europe has money, like, what's in it for, for other countries? Not, not only the money, but you also have reg regulation. You can force companies to stop importing raw materials. <laughs> At least you have a strong regulatory environment where you can force your companies. Mm. No more uncut diamonds here. Mm. No more unprocessed cocoa in the Netherlands. Mm. It has to come as a finished product. Mm. And the profits generated from that can be equitably distributed among the partners mm. involved. Yeah. From the raw material to the consumer, whatever in that value chain, we all can distribute equally. Mm. And in doing so, still save the planet. So it's a triple win. Mm -hmm. Who would lose? Yeah. So Max, the, yeah, been the, waiting the, uh, to. Yeah. The, the what did you think of the flavor the just the added flavor. by Solomon? Yes. Yeah. I, I will add some uh, bit flavor on that also. Flavor on the flavor. Yeah, okay, let's flavor go. Flavor on the flavor, <laughs> because it's all about um, 
job opportunities, mm. you know. And uh, so if we have this approach, we we'll still need to think about, I will do it like this first. We sit down with European government, with uh, American government, with Chinese government. Again, I'm talking about the perspective where African government feel and use the power they have. From that perspective, I should sit down with partners and tell them, okay, you want to, are you able to build a sustainable uh, factory to process coltan? How long it will take? He tell me like, okay, 10 years or five years, because it never can be done in one year. It takes time. In this period, I will still need to have a transitional agreement. And that is what we are talking about, equal trade certification. The time you are still processing the raw material, you send us a share in the final revenue you are making there. Mm -hmm. And concerning money, it's about changing the system of thinking. Raw materials are more valuable than money. Money is just a paper. So we can tell our partners, listen, we have Coltan. Coltan is 40% of any investment sum you will come with. You tell me 20 billions, the Coltan we have is the value of it in money is 8 billion. That is our investment. So you invest 12 billion and then we talk. So I think it's a very good idea, but we need a transitional uh, period to cover it and avoid social and all these problems in Africa we have experiencing now, migration crisis. There are a lot of challenges we need to address right now. Yes. We cannot wait one more century yes. for that. Yes, thank you. you want to say something? Marike, uh, <laughs> would you like to react and maybe also no, the idea <laughs> <laughs> on the flavor and the salt of uh, the suggestions actually? Yeah, sure, but I'm, I'm and how how so how is this? <laughs> how how can this? <laughs> maybe you can maybe you can address on how how could we address this also on the political level, whether it's the national or the EU level. So I think so. I think this is actually a, a, a great idea. It's just it, it also sort of challenges me as a uh, aspiring politician, it's newly kind of politician to up the ambitions because so far as pol policy maker, I haven't really seen. Uh, or encounter the right regulation to force companies to do something like that. Mm -hmm. I do think that you can motivate companies and, and, and also kind of by the carrot and the stick. Um, there I see a, a role for policymakers, but perhaps we should indeed look into what what else can we do to ensure that corporations actually es establish refinements in the country of origin. Um, last year I went on a, a visit with the Committee of Trade and Development Corporation to Rwanda, and there we actually saw uh, examples of that, but those companies did that voluntary, um, mm. which I think is great, and uh, you you should do that. And also in the, the way they were working there with uh, the uh, local economy, uh, that is in, in my opinion key because usually when companies go abroad, they only use their own people, they use their own resources. And I think what we need to work towards is establish this kind of new economy where the local people also um, benefit and are in charge. Um, but again. I currently don't have or don't see what kind of policy making tools we do have to uh, to make sure that this happens. But I do think when we're talking about, for example, an Africa strategy, mm -hmm. uh, as was discussed in Parliament last year, that these kind of ambitions should be in there so that we really work towards this equal uh, cooperation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marika. Thank you so much for your last words. And actually, we are uh, talking about the Africa strategy and also talking about maybe the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we have a, a special guest here in the audience. Could you maybe stand up? Jelte van Vieren. He's the director of the Africa Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And he and his department presented uh, this uh, dilemma already to you. So could you maybe reflect a little bit on uh, what has been said? Very welcome here as well. Yes. Thank you. Okay. yes. Well, 
First of all, I think I, I really must make a very big compliment to, to the group that prepared this because I think they've done an excellent job in putting it very sharply on the screen in terms of both the film and, and the motion. So mm -hmm. a big compliment for making that clear because that's exactly the discussion that we need to have. So thank you very much for that, uh, uh, all of you. Uh, thanks to the panel for, for putting the points up. And, uh, you know, it's not very difficult for me to agree with uh, saying the, the content of the motions and also what has been said about them. But there's a few items that I would like to put a bit more sharply, if I may. Yes. And please. I would like to start with one of my personal experiences. A number of months ago, we had the Kenyan president, Ruto, visiting the Netherlands about trade. And one of the things that he said, and I was, I was inspired by this, he, he literally said, if you would go to any hotel in the world and you would ask for a cup of tea, you would probably get English breakfast tea, right? Mm. So he said, well, I've been to England and I've been looking around and I was in London and in Birmingham and in Newcastle, but I haven't seen the tea plant anywhere. <laughs> so he said, I told the British, now it's time to stop this nonsense about English, British uh, or, or English uh, breakfast tea, because the tea comes from us. It doesn't come from you. So from this moment on, you call this Kenyan tea. <laughs> now, what I want to say by this is, I use this as an example of one of the things that is really prominent right now in Africa as we, as we experience it. And that is the assertiveness of African countries is rising by the day. Mm. Africa is becoming more and more aware of its economic purchasing power, its, its future as the, the, as the continent of the youth, um, but also its potential uh, in terms of economic growth and their role in the world. Mm. This translates to a political role that is more assertive and more clear, and they are becoming more clear about what they want. And this is good news because it means we can talk about equality and equal partnerships eye to eye much better than we could in the past. In the past, we didn't have the same, no. the same level of, of discussion. And we're not there yet because there is still inequality there. But we do have, I think, the wish and also the plans to work on that. that, that that's that's one, one point that, that I would like to make. The second one is I heard a number of examples, for instance, about mm -hmm. you know, investing in critical raw materials and in the production and in the... In, 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 you know, uh, uh, developing the, the, the value chains in, the, in African countries. Yes, and that is also part and parcel of our Africa strategy, that we would like to stimulate that that happens. However, Africa is not a country. There are 54 countries in Africa. Some of them, this is not very difficult to do, and there are plenty of opportunities, and I'll mention just one or two just now. But there are also many countries where this is far more difficult. You mentioned uh, the example of Coal Town in Congo. Yeah. This is one of the most notoriously difficult countries to work in, also mm -hmm. from a private sector's point of view. So I agree. This is not going to work in the short term, but it doesn't mean that you can't work anywhere else in Africa. So there are plenty of opportunities that you need to find, and you have to find the real win-win situations to start off with. Uh, two examples. Uh, cocoa was a you know, the point discussed. It's, I don't think it's a critical raw material in terms of energy transition, but still, it's prominent because we have such an important role as the Netherlands mm. in, in the cocoa trade. Yes. Okay, fine. <laughs> when I get enthusiastic, I do this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, no, thanks very much for this. It's good, good, good to be reminded. Uh, talking about cocoa, and uh, for those of you who have been in the discussion with uh, former minister Jan Prong before, there was a remark made about import tariffs and the difference in Europe that of import tariffs for raw cocoa and for chocolate. Mm. Bye -bye. Import tariffs for raw cocoa are far lower than for chocolate, which causes for African countries to export the raw materials. That could be done. It's to the benefit of the chocolate factories here. Yep. But exporting processed chocolate from Africa to Europe is financially far more difficult. Yeah. That's where the government can play a role. Yeah. So the, the Africa strategy is not only about equality and about equal partnerships yeah. and about joint economic development. It's also about coherence yeah. as a priority factor. Yeah. So this is one thing I would like to add to the discussion. It's, it's about giving with one hand and taking with the other. Yeah. It maybe has been a characteristic of our dealing with African countries. Yeah. We need to turn that around. And the nice thing about the strategy that we now have is it's a government strategy. It's not mm. foreign affairs. It's not development. It's not any particular ministry. It's been agreed to at the highest political level in the Netherlands. It's a cabinet strategy. Mm. That's not going to change even though we have elections. No. I hope. <laughs> 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 you never know. What's but anyway, uh, it, so, so it is a strategy in which we as the guardians of what is in there, because I consider that to be our role, yeah. Yeah. I can talk to other ministries and confront them with incoherent elements of how we deal with African countries yeah. and ask them to correct this. And I think that is a, a very valuable part of what we're trying to do. And then we can maybe address this issue of the difference in import tariffs. Not necessarily easily because it's EU, so we need to bring that up to that level. 
but we first need to agree as a government between different ministries that this is the way forward, this is how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. We want to fight this incoherence and we want to be a coherent, trustworthy partner that is dealing with African countries on an equal basis. And this really helps. Thank you so much, uh, Elsa. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really, really, really one short. Word. Yes, one. Yes. What Let's uh, see how it's going to work. Just yeah. to reflect on what the President uh, Utu from Kenya said, I should have said against this, uh, to these English people, you can call it English tea, it doesn't matter, but call it Kenyan money. Mm. When you sell it, you think about which part of the money has to go to Kenya. <laughs> then you can call it my grandma coffee or tea. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> well taken, well taken. Thank you so much. <laughs> I have um, time for two short questions from the audience to the panelists. Um, can I have, thank you so much. Please uh, formulate your question, short and boundy. I see two questions over here. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for a very, very uh, engaging discussion. And we've been talking about Africa for decades. What does that look like in terms of indicators? Who's going to track that? Mm. What actions? So it's great to have amazing uh, thoughts and ideas. What does that look like on ground? Do we have a target? You know, like we have target for emissions. Mm. Do we have a target and who's tracking that and how do we get there? And how do we keep that accountable, that action is actually being done? Good question. Can someone relate on it? Solomon or Mariko or Max? <laughs> okay. So unfortunately, data that I have seen and I've worked with, there is no one universal source that is coherent. So the World Bank issues uh, some kind of target. You find the Union Development uh, Agency on Trade issue a different target, different ministries. Uh, at the national level, bilateral level, they issue different targets. And of course, um, the funny thing about Africa is always that you divide and rule. So um, Europeans go in and they divide it and everybody has a piece to pick and they all have their individual targets. Different development agencies have their indi uh, individual targets. But I haven't seen one conversation that simply says we need to have X amount of targets for the whole of Africa. And like uh, the president pointed out, Africa is a country of 54 a uh, uh, continent of 54 countries, and it's quite difficult uh, uh, to, to work with some, uh, some countries. But um, I think it's time for us to start having a narrative at the bilateral level, EU level, uh, the IMF World Bank level, where yeah. parties, all parties get to agree, uh, for example, on the global taxation level, yeah. uh, emission level, uh, <laughs> trade level. Um, and that should be the point that we should be moving towards. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, I'm sorry to say, is all over the place and fragmented. Yeah, and, and, and maybe also to add on, maybe th one of the examples, I think the youth also mentioned it in their uh, presentation, is also look at uh, Africa as, as a continent and within the continent there are also good examples. I mean, looking at Botswana and how they, maybe this is also something, the examples don't only have to come from outside of the continent. Yeah. And just to add a bit more salt on what you said, um, and that's maybe interesting for the Minister of Foreign Affairs, initiate a collaboration at uh, knowledge institutions levels. Mm. So we have what we call the Equal Trade Academic Alliance. When we analyze value chains from both sides, the mainstream side of the value chain and the downstream side of the value chain, Concerning COCOA, you could have the University of Accra of Cape Coast working together with the University of Wageningen and Rotterdam to come up with data concerning any topic you should like. Yeah. So that should also be part of when we talk about equality in relationship, yeah. it should also be applied at knowledge level. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I have room for one more question. I don't see anyone here. I see here, here, and one here in front. Yes. Okay. So Maybe my question uh, pertains to the military-industrial complex, uh, with regards to like the divide and rule uh, politics, also by the EU Commission and the EU Parliament, because currently um, there is a genocide going on. A silent. It's called like a silent Holocaust in the DRC. Um, and paramilitary organizations are financed by the EU 
also the Dutch government um, indirectly because uh, there's like military uh, cooperation with Rwanda and Rwanda uh, finances. Okay, sorry. So, <laughs> yes. so my question is because I also wanted to ask this as a motion, but it was not included. My, ask, my question is, um, how do you see um, the uh, role of legislation and maybe certain mandatory accountability mechanisms or other legal instruments possibly to um, disincentivize um, yeah, these, these conflicts uh, in the finance? I think it's, yeah. Who would like to react first to it? Could you? Actually, this was the last question, right? I'm looking at the, okay, maybe one really quick. I see one and then, but please formulate it. That was not short and bondy, by the way, so. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm just gonna piggyback on, that, uh, on, on the same question and uh, is uh, in terms of how can you bring equality or how can you guarantee equality in trading when the starting point of some African uh, uh, countries are that the 85% of their net reserves mm. lie on another European country. Mm. And that European country has the say in on what they spend that money on. And I'm talking about France and the uh, yeah. Bia, CIMAC yeah. region. Good question. Thank you so much. We have two questions. Maybe just quickly reflect on whichever you would like to reflect and then we have to close it. So you can take the first one. Marika, for you the word. Okay, sure. A uh, bit less of an expert on finance, but uh, what I think is most important is normally, or often we see that finance and trade are sort of separate and we kind of neglect to trace finance. And when it comes to the funding, indirect funding of a conflict uh, in a country, uh, that usually happens because we don't see where finance goes. And when we have, uh, when we talk about corporate sustainability, sustainability then we often only look at the trades and we don't look at the finances and especially the Netherlands I think has the power and also has the um, responsibility because we, we we have certain tax rules that make the flow of money quite easy a bit mm. too easy in my opinion so I think that is what we should address so that we at least know where the money goes and then we can also better regulate it because right now we don't actually know where it goes uh, or, or too we know too little where it goes Thank you, Marika. Max? Okay, so I will uh, talk about both questions. Um, so the starting point for your concern that private military or some kind of uh, military intervention to protect uh, investment in Africa for these kinds of things, I think um, it's more private sector driven. And so it's not something that we should simply leave it to the politicians to regulate. I think, I think it starts from us as consumers. Mm. You have an iPhone. Yeah. Yes, you do. You have electronics around you that is powered by the same cobalt that people are suffering. I think the starting point should be that we should hold our government and private companies responsible for their action. You want an electric vehicle, but it comes as a cost, uh, at a cost. And so that, that should be a starting point to start demanding accountability. I need an iPhone, but I want you to obtain it and provide it to me sustainably, uh, conflict-free. Yeah? Mm. Now, getting back to your question on uh, yeah, the reserves that France keeps, I think that narrative is beginning to be sharper. I think that uh, France has recognized that already. I think that at some point uh, in the last uh, eight months alone, we have had six or seven coups in, uh, in, coup in yeah. Africa, yeah. Uh, signaling the same yeah. problem. And I think that this is just a starting point for us to have a narrative. Yeah. I think we shouldn't have it in isolation, uh, different from all the other points we've discussed. I think it should be part of that, that discussion. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes. Closing words <laughs> for Max. <laughs> yeah, also very short. I, I, I hope this kind of discussion uh, will help all of us to come together and stand up for a new area in the relation between Africa and Europe. We should work on that one because we need each other. And we are not doing it for Africa only or for Europe, but let's think we are citizen of one world. We should love each other instead of thinking competition. So I would like to close it in this way. Thank you so much, yes.
Thank you, everyone. So the Africa Think Tank would love to get their feedback on their ideas and also their visions. So they've created a Mentimeter, like you can see here. You can all scan it. For those who don't have a phone, uh, feel free to stay here. They are all here, so you can also discuss it with them or share your ideas with them. Maybe they can stand up as well. Um, no, you don't want to stand up? Stand up, youth. Stand up. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you all for being in this session with us. It was a great, great session. I would like to thank all the panelists and, of course, the Africa Youth Think Tank, FMS, and especially Rahel, I don't know if she's here, for making this all possible. Where's Rahel? Is she here? There she is. Hi, Rahel. Um, it's such an important uh, uh, topic and concrete action should be taken to make and shape a truly equitable relationship and safeguard a livable future for young people everywhere. Um, if you want to learn more about the ideas uh, or you have some specific feedback, please stay around them. You just saw them, saw them and have a chat with them. And uh, I would always say, please, everything what you've heard today, take it in your work, take it when you're talking with your neighbor, take it with you, because I think we need all of us to change uh, this perspective. So thank you all very much.